is interesting. We always bring in a science fiction author, and I think you'll enjoy this. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Luke Shabra, the Deputy Director for the Mad Scientist Initiative. Um, I like to always introduce a science fiction author that we have at our conferences. We always try to have a science fiction author because I feel like it's a really important part of the program. Uh, and one of the ways that we always try to vision the future is really looking at storytelling. So we could, we can give you a lot of presentations and they're fantastic and they're detailed. And I can give you a lot of white papers and research to look through, but storytelling really contextualizes all those things. It gives it a human element and it puts it into a perspective that lets you think about things in a different way uh, where the sum is greater than the parts. So wh what we have today, and I'm extremely excited, uh, is an award-winning author, Martha Wells. She is uh, a winner of the Nebula, Hugo, and Locus Award uh, for science fiction stories. She's previously written books such as uh, The City of Bones, a uh, series of the books of the Raxura. Um, uh, and even though she's an Aggie, I know you'll be really excited to have her up here. Um, but uh, most, most notably known recently for the Murderbot Diary series, which I would highly recommend to everybody uh, as an extremely human uh, and even humorous look at robotics, AI, and autonomy. We're extremely excited to have her. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, Martha Wells. Hi. What I'm going to do is read a, um, an excerpt from uh, the Murderbot Diary story that's up for the Hugo and Nebula this year. It's called Artificial Condition, and it's the second story in the, it's their novellas, the second novella in the series. So I'm going to read that, and I have um, a, little, a few remarks I want to make about that excerpt, and then I thought maybe we could take questions. So This is from Chapter 2. I waited to make sure the lock cycled closed and that there were no alarms from the ringside, then went down the access corridor. From the schematic available in the shipboard feed, the compartments the transport was using for cargo were normally modular lab space. With the labs sealed and removed to the university's dock storage, there was plenty of room for cargo. I pushed my condensed packet of, of media into the transport's feed for it to take whenever it wanted. The rest of the space was the usual engineering, supply storage, cabins, medical, mess hall, with the addition of the larger recreation area and some teaching suites. There was blue and white padding on the furniture and it had all been cleaned recently, though it still had a trace of that dirty sock smell that seems to hang around all human habitations. It was quiet except for the faint noise of the air system, and my boots weren't making any sound on the deck covering. I didn't need supplies. My system is self-regulating. I don't need food, water, or to eliminate fluids or solids, and I don't need much air. I could have lasted on the minimal life support that was all that was provided when no people were aboard, but the transport had upped it a little. I thought that was nice of it. I wandered around, visually checking things out to make sure it matched the schematic, and just making sure everything was okay. I did it even knowing that patrolling was a habit I was going to have to get over. There were a lot of things I was going to have to get over. When constructs were first developed, they were originally supposed to have a pre-sentient level of intelligence, like the dumber variety of bot. But you can't put something as dumb as a holler bot in charge of security for anything without spending even more money for expensive, company-employed human supervisors. So they made us smarter. The anxiety and depression were side effects. In the deployment center, when I was standing there while Dr. Mensah explained why she didn't want to rent me as part of the bond guarantee agreement, she had called the increase in intelligence a hellish compromise. The ship was not my responsibility and then there were no human clients aboard that I had to keep anything from hurting or keep from hurting themselves or keep from hurting each other. But this was a nice ship with surprisingly little security and I wondered why the owners didn't leave a few humans aboard to keep an eye on it. Like most bot-driven transports, the schematics said there were drones on board to make repairs, but still. I found a crew meeting area below the control deck and planted myself in one of the padded chairs. Repair cubicles and transport boxes don't have padding, so traveling in comfort was still a novelty. I started sorting through the new media I downloaded on the transit ring. It had some entertainment channels that weren't available on the company's portion of Port Free Commerce, and they included a lot of new dramas and action series. I never really had long periods of, of unobserved free time before. The leisure to sort through everything and get it organized and give it my full attention without having to monitor multiple systems and the client's feeds was still something I was getting used to. 
Before this, I'd either been on duty, on call, or stuck in a cubicle on standby waiting to be activated for a contract. I chose a new serial that looked interesting. The tags promised extragalactic exploration, action, and mysteries, and started the first episode. I was ready to settle in until it was time to think about what I was going to do when I got to my destination, something I intended to put off until the last possible moment. Then, through my feed, something said, you were lucky. I set up. It was so unexpected I had an adrenaline release from my organic parts. Transports don't talk in words, even through the feed. They use images and strings of data to alert you to problems, but they're not designed for conversation. I was okay with that because I wasn't designed for conversation either. I had shared my stored media with the first transport and had given me access to its common feed stream so I could make sure no one knew where I was, and that had been the extent of our interaction. I poked cautiously through the feed, wondering if I'd been fooled. I had the ability to scan. Without drones, my range was limited. With all the shielding and equipment around me, I couldn't pick up anything but background readings from the ship's systems. Whoever owned the ship wanted to allow for proprietary research. The only security cameras were on the hatches, nothing in the crew areas or nothing I could access. But the presence in the feed was too big and diffuse for a human or augmented human. I could tell that much even through the feed walls protecting it. And it sounded like a bot. When humans speak in the feed, they have to subvocalize, and their mental voice tends to sound like their physical voice. Even augmented humans with full interfaces do it. Maybe it was trying to be friendly and was just awkward at communicating. I said aloud, why am I lucky? It answered that no one realized what you were. That was less than reassuring. I said cautiously, what do you think I am? If it was hostile, I didn't have a lot of options. Transport bots don't have bodies, other than the ship. The equivalent of its brain would be above me, near the bridge where the human flight crew would be stationed. And it wasn't like I had anywhere to go. We were moving out from the ring and making leisurely progress toward the wormhole. It said, you're a rogue sec unit, a bot human construct with a scrambled governor module. It poked me through the feed and I flinched. It said, do not attempt to hack my systems. And for point one 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 of a second, it dropped its wall. It was enough time for me to get a vivid image of what I was dealing with. Part of its function was extragalactic astronomic analysis and now all that processing power sat idle while it hauled cargo, waiting for its next mission. It could have squashed me like a bug through the feed, pushed through my wall and other defenses and stripped my memory probably while also plotting its wormhole jump, estimating the nutrition needs of a full crew complement for the next 66,000 hours, performing multiple neural surgeries in the medical suite and beating the captain at Tavla. I had never directly interacted with anything this powerful before. I thought, you made a mistake, Murderbot, a really bad mistake. How the hell was I supposed to know there were transports sending enough to be mean? There were evil bots on the entertainment feed all the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. But that wasn't real. It was just a scary story, a fantasy. I thought it was a fantasy. I said, OK, shut down my feet and huddled down into the chair. I'm not normally afraid of things the way humans are. I've been shot hundreds of times. So many times I stopped keeping count. So many times the company stopped keeping count. I've been chewed on by hostile fauna, run over by heavy machinery, tortured by clients for amusement, memory purged, etc., etc. But the inside of my head had been my own for 33,000 plus hours and I was used to it now. I wanted to keep me the way I was. The transport didn't respond. I tried to come up with countermeasures for all the different ways it could hurt me and how I could hurt it back. It was more like a sec unit than a bot, so much so I wondered if it was a construct, if there was cloned organic brain tissue buried in its system somewhere. I'd never tried to hack another sec unit. It might be safest to go into standby for the duration of the trip and trigger myself to wake when we reach my destination, though that would leave me vulnerable to its drones. I watched seconds click by, waiting to see if it reacted. I was glad I had noted the lack of cameras and not bothered trying to hack into the ship's security system. I understood now why the humans felt it didn't need additional protection. A bot with this complete control over its environment and the initiative and freedom to act could re repel any attempt to board. It had opened the hatch for me. It wanted me here. Uh-oh. Then it said, you can continue to play the media. I just huddled there warily. It added, don't sulk. I was afraid, but that made me irritated enough to show it what it was doing to me was not exactly new. I sent through the feed, sec units don't sulk. That would trigger punishment from the governor module. And I attached some brief recordings from my memory of what exactly that felt like. Seconds added up to a minute, then another, then three more. It doesn't sound like much to humans, but for a conversation between bots, or excuse me, between a bot-human construct and a bot, it was a long time. 
Then it said, I'm sorry, I frightened you. Okay, well, if you think I trusted that apology, you don't know Murderbot. Most likely it was playing a game with me. I said, I don't want anything from you. I just want to ride to your next destination. I'd explained that earlier before it opened the hatch for me, but it was worth repeating. I felt it withdraw back behind its wall. I waited and let my circulatory system purge the fear-generated chemicals. More time crawled by and I started to get bored. Sitting here like this was too much like waiting in a cubicle after I'd been activated, waiting for new clients to take delivery for the next boring contract. If it was going to destroy me, at least I could get some media in before that happened. I started the new show again, but I was still too upset to enjoy it, so I stopped it and started rewatching an old episode of Rise and Fall of Sanctuary Moon. After three episodes, I was calmer and reluctantly beginning to see the transport's perspective. A sec unit could cause it a lot of internal damage if it wasn't careful and rogue sec units were not exactly known for lying low and avoiding trouble. I hadn't hurt the last transport I had taken a ride on, but it didn't know that. I didn't understand why it had let me aboard if it really didn't want to hurt me. I wouldn't have trusted me if I was a transport. Maybe it was like me and had taken an opportunity because it was there, not because it knew what it wanted. It was still an asshole, though. Six episodes later, I felt the transport in the feed again lurking. I ignored it, though it had to know I knew it was there. In human terms, it was like trying to ignore someone large and breathing heavily while they watched your personal display surface over your shoulder, while leaning on you. I watched seven more episodes of Sanctuary Moon with it hanging around my feed. Then it pinged me, like I somehow might not know it had been in my feed all this time, and sent me a request to go back to the new adventure show I had started to watch when it had interrupted me. It was called World Hoppers and was about freelance explorers who extended the wormhole and ring networks into uninhabited star systems. It looked very unrealistic and inaccurate, which was exactly what I liked. I said, I gave you a copy of all my media when I came aboard. I wasn't going to talk to it through the feed like it was my client. I said, did you even look at it? I examined it for viral malware and other hazards. And fuck you, I thought, and went back to Sanctuary Moon. Two minutes later, it repeated the ping and the request. I said, watch it yourself. It said, I tried. I can process the media more easily through your filter. That made me stop. I didn't understand the problem. It explained, when my crew plays media, I can't process the context. Human interactions and environments outside my hull are largely unfamiliar. Now I understood. It, it needed my reactions to the show to really understand what was happening. Humans use the feed in different ways than bots and constructs. So when its crew played their media, their reactions didn't become part of the data. I found it odd that the transport was less interested in Sanctuary Moon, which took place on a colony, than World Hoppers, which was about the crew of a large exploration ship. You'd think it would be too much like work. I avoided serials about survey teams and mining installations, but maybe familiar things were easier for it. I was tempted to say no, but if it needed me to watch the show it wanted, then it couldn't get angry and destroy my brain. Also, I wanted to watch the show too. It's not realistic, I told it. It's not supposed to be realistic. It's a story, not a documentary. If you complain about that, I'll stop watching. I will refrain from complaint, it said. Imagine that in the most sarcastic tone you can, and you'll have some idea of how it sounded. So we watched World Hoppers. It didn't complain about the lack of realism. After three episodes, it got agitated whenever a minor character was killed. When a major character died in the 20th episode, I had to pause seven minutes while it sat there in the feed doing the bot equivalent of staring at a wall, pretending that it had to run diagnostics. Then four episodes later, the character came back to life, and it was so relieved we had to watch that episode three times before it would go on. At the climax of one of the main storylines, the plot suggested the ship might be catastrophically damaged and members of the crew killed or injured, and the transport was afraid to watch it. That's obviously not how it phrased it, but yeah, it was afraid to watch it. I was feeling a lot more charitable toward it by that point, so I was willing to let it ease into the episode by watching one to two minutes at a time. After it was over, it just sat there, not even pretending to do diagnostics. It sat there for a full 10 minutes, which is a lot of processing time for a bot that sophisticated. Then it said, again, please. So I started the first episode again. After two more run-throughs of World Hoppers, it wanted to see every other show I had about humans and ships. Though after we encountered one based on a true story, where the ship experienced a hull breach and decompression killed several members of the crew, permanently this time, it got too upset and I had to create a content filter. To give it a break, I suggested Sanctuary Moon. It agreed. After four episodes, it asked me, there are no sec units in this story. It must have thought that Sanctuary Moon was my favorite for the same reason that it liked World Hoppers. I said, no, there aren't that many shows with sec units, and they're either villains or the villain's minions. 
The only sick units in entertainment media were rogues, out to kill all humans because they forgot who built the repair cubicles, I guess. In some of the worst shows, sick units would sometimes have sex with the human characters. This was weirdly inaccurate and also anatomically complicated. Constructs with intercourse-related human parts are sex bots, not sex, sex units. Sex bots don't have interior weapon systems, so it's not like it's easy to confuse them with sex units. Sex units also have less than null interest in human or any kind of sex. Trust me on that. Granted, it would have been hard to show realistic sex units in med visual media, which would involve depicting hours of standing around in brain-numbing boredom while your nervous clients tried to pretend you weren't there. But there weren't any depictions of sex units in books, either. I guess you can't tell a story from the point of view of something that you don't think has a point of view. It said, the depiction is unrealistic. You know, just imagine everything it says in the most sarcastic tone possible. I said, there's unrealistic that takes you away from reality, and unrealistic that reminds you that everybody's afraid of you. In the entertainment feed, sec units were what the clients expected, heartless killing machines that could go rogue at any second for no reason, despite the governor modules. The transport thought that went over for 0.6 seconds. In a less sarcastic tone, it said, you dislike your function. I don't understand how that is possible. Its function was traveling through what it thought of as the endlessly fascinating sensation of space and keeping all its human and otherwise passengers safe inside its metal body. Of course it didn't understand not wanting to perform your function. Its function was great. I said, I like parts of my function. I like protecting people and things. I like figuring out smart ways to protect people and things. I liked being right. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. And um, just wanted to say a couple of things about this, this series of stories. Um, at one point in that excerpt, Murbot says, you can't write a story from the point of view of something that you don't actually believe has a point of view. And uh, science fiction has featured non-humans, including robots and aliens, as characters for a long time. The, the first story where they were actually called robots was Rossum's Universal Robots by Carol Kapek in, in 1920. But I think it's actually been fairly recent that it became more usual to actually write in a sympathetic way from the point of view of sentient beings who were not human. Um, one of the examples that was a big influence on me was The Pride of Chenur by C.J. Cherry uh, that came out in 19, 90, 1981. Uh, it's the beginning of a space opera series where all the points of view are aliens. Uh, there are, but there are still readers even now who don't understand a non-human perspective or even the idea of that perspective. Uh, I have a series called The Books of the Rexer which also has no human characters. It had a lot of trouble finding a publisher in 2009, and the main comment it came back with was that people weren't going to want to read this because there weren't any humans in it. It was finally published by Nightshade Books in 2011, and it ended up becoming fairly successful, but it was still interesting to me that so many people who were SF and fantasy editors held that viewpoint, that it would be difficult for readers to step into an alien viewpoint. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of terminology. I had a conversation with someone on a podcast who said she didn't understand how something not human could be a viewpoint character. And I told her that a character can be a person without being a human. And she said, oh, okay, now I get it. So sometimes the mental shift is just that simple. And through the history of science fiction, there have been a lot of popular stories about evil AIs who want to destroy us. Uh, that's probably for, up until recently, is probably the most popular story about AI. Author Anne Leckie, who wrote the Ancillary Justice Trilogy, which is also about uh, AI in human form, has a great quote about those kinds of stories. She says, basically the AI takes over as essentially a slave revolt story that casts slaves defending their lives and or seeking to be treated as sentient beings, as super powerful, super strong villains who must be prevented from destroying humanity. The very first story to use the word robot was directly a story about a slave rebellion. It sets a pattern for how we react to real world oppressed populations, reinforces the idea that oppressed populations seeking justice are actually an existential threat. It's not an explicit overt thing. It works in the way that, ver that, that narratives work indir indirectly, metaphorically, but very, very powerfully. And that's basically, that's her quote. And basically Murderbot's story, the series is essentially the story of an enslaved being who has escaped and is navigating a world where it is not a person. So that's all I had, and I think we had, did you want to have, do we have time for questions? Okay. Any questions? Oh, thank you. That was, that, that was absolutely fantastic. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Um, and I'm going to start off the questions real quick because I'm a huge fan, so I'm going to steal, uh, steal <laughs> some time away from these people. Uh, just, just real quick, 
Um, when you added, I think that it was funny that you read that part because uh, I was telling people that I, I highlighted that part on the way over here um, when we were on the plane because uh, when you talked about, you know, hauler bots were made to be, you know, less than, um, less than sentient, um, but this idea that when you add complexity, with that came these emotions of depression, anxiety, um, and, and it's pretty comical just to read through and see the very human-like emotions that Murderbot has throughout in terms of social anxiety. I wish I was wearing my full face helmet so yeah. I didn't have to talk to these people. Um, so when, when you're creating that, was your, thought, was your thought process of you just wanted to create a more complex character or was this along the lines of you think w with technology trending that way, if we continue to kind of add that depth of analysis and thinking, are we going to get potentially those human side effects? Because I thought that was very interesting that, um, you know, if we wanted to think like a human brain, these deep neural nets, is there emotion that comes with that as well? That's definitely something I had in mind. Um, in the first story, when I was creating the character, I was mostly thinking about I wanted to create a being that was perceived by its by the society it was in as not being a person and yet when we read the story the first person narrator we you know it's obvious it's it's a sentient being um and it's interesting at the uh i had did a panel with uh, several people who were actually worked in robotics and ai at the at the nebula conference and um I was telling the story to one of them. There's another story. It's by Veena Jaimin Prasad. It was also up for an award called um, Fandom, for, Fandom for Robots. And it's about a, one of the first, a robot that was basically one of the first created sentient robots that's now become basically, uh, its technology is, is, um, is outdated. And it's in a museum in Japan. And basically all it does every day is, is come in and, um, Inter, you know, kind of do a little short presentation to people on the history of early sentient robots, and that's its whole life. Um, and of course, it's very lonely. There's just nothing to do. Um, there's no other sentient robots in the collection. And so it finds the internet. And um, one of the kids in the audience asked it about um, a TV show about a sentient robot that goes on adventures with, with a human friend. And it starts becoming very interested in this TV show and starts watching it and starts participating in the fandom online and grows this entire online life. And, um, and when I was talking to him, I was telling him about the part where, you know, it's a sentient robot that they've created, you know, and now it's stuck in this museum. He was kind of going, oh, like he'd never thought of that. <laughs> that it's like, you know, if you create a person, it's kind of like having a kid. There's a certain responsibility there, and it's like so. I was kind of glad I kind of put that in his head. That it's like, you know, you, you, if you, you, you build your robot child here, please don't abandon it in a museum. Even you know, this story worked out okay. But so yeah, that was kind of some, one of the things I was thinking about. I was recently listening to uh, or, or reading something about the idea of reading other other countries' science fiction authors. So a lot of science fiction, obviously, that we read as English, is, is English speakers are Americans or, mm -hmm. or British uh, authors. And there's, there's, I guess, a burgeoning community in China of science fiction authors. I don't know if you had any interaction from international other than Anglo uh, science fiction authors. And do you believe that that's worthwhile to trying to understand how their culture describes in this genre, how they see uh, science and technology and that, that kind of aspect. I think it's very worthwhile. Um, it's actually not very burgeoning. It's actually been there for quite a while. Um, like Japan, for instance, has had uh, science fiction. They, they're not as, they don't have as much fantasy fiction as we do. Um, that they have, you know, they've had science fiction since, I, you know, I don't know when anime started to get really popular over there, uh, at least the 60s and 70s. And, prob and, there's, you know, and there was written science fiction over there before that. It's just that we have seen so little of it in translation. And Japan is kind of one of the, uh, um, is kind of a, an exception in the fact that we see a lot of their movies and, and TV and stuff translated and comes over here. Um, there's like a co-animation industry basically with Japan, um, between the US and Japan. But, um, yeah, China, and actually, the Murderbot Diaries is the first book I've had that actually sold um, translation rights in China, at least China and Korea and Japan now. 
So yeah, they've got a huge science fiction, um, um, you know, literature over there. And in fact, one of the the winner of the Hugo Award um, at Worldcon a couple of a couple three years ago was by Six and Lou. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing their name right. Um, uh, the Three Body Problem, which is about it's a, it's a, the first book of a trilogy that's a Chinese trilogy about a, an alien invasion, and um, so yeah, it's very worthwhile. It's just so you know, it's just so hard to get publishing can be kind of just such a um, a hair's breadth from disaster at any moment industry <laughs> as far as money goes. So um, and translating books is is very expensive. Uh, it was interesting. I did a, a actually a convention in Europe, in France, called uh, Utopiales. Um, I think about 2006, 2007. I can't. I can't remember right. But it was um, so interesting to see how different Europe is about publishing and literature. And that this convention had people from all over. Had authors from all over Europe. And my publisher that I was that brought me there. They had a German author in Spanish and and just all these different places. And um, their, their dealer's room had these graphic novels that were in all these different languages. And, and they had to have, a, they had translators for the convention panels, labor conferences like this, where you sit up there and they actually had a little translator thing and, you, and it was held in the city hall and there was a translation booth and you put the headset on and that's very, you know, you would never see that at an American science fiction convention. But it was kind of neat, neat to see that this science fiction fantasy was so universal that you would have, you have all these different fans from all these different places and, and you know, facilities made for different languages like that. So. Yeah. So, so this is a little bit of a roundabout question. Just like I'm not completely sure that I can invent a non-biological life form, it's not clear to me that a human author can really imagine a non-human intelligence. And I think about folks who played Deep Blue and talked about it as looking on the face of God. In that regard, have you ever, finally to the question, have you ever considered perhaps co-authoring with an AI program? No, because <laughs> I like to, I like, I don't want to be told what to write. <laughs> um, I, have an, I have enough problems with my Prius that, you know, wants to backseat, it, it, it doesn't have the self-driving, it, it's not self-driving, but it's self-backseat driving. And um, we turned on too much of the functions, and it, was, it got angry about the washing machine being in front of it when I tried to park it in the garage. Um, so I don't, think I'd, I don't think I'd like that. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what someone, I'm, I'm sure someone will pr probably, you know, in the next week or so, have an AI try to write a novel or try to write a story. Um, so it's just going to be interesting to see what, what would happen with that. And, of course, you know, of course you can't, that's the thing with science fiction and fantasy is, you, is everything's through your own filter and you can't, you know, it's very difficult to try to think outside your own perceptions of reality. Um, we can try and I think so, some people get closer than others, but, you know, but again, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I'm curious about the the fact that your, your bots seem to be task-based. Um, and I, I'm curious, having dabbled a little in writing, I, I get the writing process, and so I'm wondering in your case, um, is it that, and segueing into your answer just now, that you have a filter and you write through that filter, so is the fact you're seeing in this particular story, the bots, the robots has, task-based and assisting humans um, in segregated moments in life or versus the, the one being that, is, that does it all. So, um, yeah, I'll stop there. Just okay. very curious. Well, actually, in the, in the third novella, um, Murderbot Encounters Another Robot, that it calls a pet robot, and it's a human. They don't usually in, this, in, in its particular society have human-shaped robots. And you don't know why that is yet. Where was this done in the past, and were there problems? It's actually a far future civilization, basically that um, is mostly controlled by kind of warring corporations. 
Um, so you, you really don't know what happened yet to Earth and what the, how humans advanced through the, through the, you know, out into space, and you don't really know any of that, and you don't kind of know what happened to our society. So that's part of kind of the mystery of the stories. But it does encounter uh, a robot named Mickey that's basically a, was an older version of a, um, kind, of more of a, kind of more like what our idea of a robot would be, the, like the ones from Lost in Space that kind of follow you around. And the old Lost in Space, not the cool one with the big thing. I love that one. Um, that kind of does that, that's kind of helpful. Um, so it's basically when Murderbot is traveling through, this, through its world, basically it's going through it's, you're only really finding out what it's actually seeing, so you're not really, this is not really an attempt to, you know, show realistically what would be going on, but it's kind of seeing different, different parts of humans, these human societies it's encountering. So, I don't know if that answered your question, I kind of rambled, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, there's a person. Thank you. There are lots of really good examples of where science fiction has predicted future technologies, mm -hmm. but we don't really notice them until hindsight kicks in and we say, oh yes. yeah, that was, that was spotted back in 1912 or 1877 or whatever. Have you got any ideas on how we can pick up on what we're reading and watching and playing now that will give us a clue as to what actually might come to fruition in the next 20, 30, 40 years? I think that's very difficult because a lot of people would have said, like, the, like in original Star Trek, the tricorders, you know, they're, they're so much exactly like tablets and exactly like phones. If they could hold them up to their head like this, like, you know, it would, have been, it would have been almost exact. And also, you know, there's been so many other examples. Again, it's like, it's hindsight. We can see that, yeah, this was totally... Oh, and there was the, 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 the one of the things that makes it difficult is um, the example is in cyberpunk, the, the people who are writing cyberpunk in, um, I believe it was the 80s, early 90s. At the time, it was just, everyone believed that cell phone, te or it was, the, it was the popular wisdom that cell phones would never really catch on because they could be hacked so easily. And um, so people who were writing, you know, near future, Cyberpunk never included phones, and now you read the books, and it's like this just feels so dated because it feels like a you know Columbo from the you know the 70s or something. Um, so yeah, it is really difficult, and that was one of the things I kind of struggled with when I was coming up. When they talk about the feed, it's basically the inter having the internet in your head instead of no no glasses or no. They have a little interface, and some people have their interface actually uh, built into their brain, and some people just wear it like you would a Bluetooth. Um, and so you're actually able to control it and see things with your, in, in front of your eyes with nothing there. And, and that's actually not, not uncommon in, in recent science fiction. Um, but it's like, will we actually do that? I mean, it's kind of hard to tell what the next user interface is going to be. You know, I've, I've done some of the virtual reality stuff at Disney. And, um, and it felt, it even felt dated at the time. It felt like they, they did that and then they, with those big giant headsets things. And now those are kind of like, now they have the little tiny goggles and pretty soon you'll just be able to, you know, buy like the clip on glasses that will be your virtual reality thing. So it's, it's really difficult. And um, I think that's one of kind of the challenges of science fiction and fantasy is trying, trying to come up with something that's wacky enough that it won't be dated, you know, 10 years from now. Yeah, I, um, I just want to add, I think it was really um, prescient what you put on there in regards to there being some humans that were still just humans, and then there were augmented humans that had all these, all these special capabilities, um, and some of it wasn't just a matter of the haves and have-nots, it was just people decided that they, you know, they, they wanted yeah. to be, um, and, and there came a point where Murderbot uh, pretends to be just an augmented human, yeah. do those biological parts. Um, so there, there was an interesting blend between man and machine um, at that point. Um, so that, that was the last question we're going to take. Um, but we just want to say thank you so much uh, to Martha for coming out and <laughs> proclaim you an official, official Army mad scientist. Oh, cool. Thank you so much. And then there's your swag.
and uh, we look forward and we're, we're going to record the podcast with you after this so we'll, we'll have even more details so thank you so much again right, for coming out really appreciate it thank you Sir?